Uh, this evening, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians is right before Second Ephesians. Just kidding. New Testament, right before Philippians, right after Galatians. We're going to be there too. <laughs> so this, so this, this, this whole class thing is just for kicks and giggles, so uh, it is. It's, it's a kick and giggles kind of a class, which is probably good. But we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. And I've been sitting in the book of Ephesians now for a while. I'm starting to feel like Stephen. I'm never going to get out of Ephesians. But uh, we're actually just going to do a kind of a word book survey. And it'll make sense as we go on. But uh, I want to... I want to give you a concept, and then I want to dig into Scripture, if you will. Um, so if you, have your, if you have the book of Ephesians, stick your finger in there or stick a piece of paper, and then also turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. Do, do you need this? So we need Ephesians. So a finger in Ephesians, which is New Testament. And then also 2 Kings, which is toward the front of your Bibles, chapter 6. <clears throat> so 2 Kings, uh, it's, it's like the eighth or so book of the Bible. So we need Ephesians and 2 Kings chapter 6. So while you're turning there, let me give you this concept. Now, I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I've, waken, I've awoken, awakened. What's the, what's the grammar? I've awakened. I've awakened. Hmm. I, I woke up from my sleep. And uh, I was in that state where I was in a half dream world and in half in reality. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you're like, where am I? Uh, who am I? Uh, what am I? I mean, you start having these questions because you're just disoriented. and You're not really sure where you're at, what you're doing. And especially if you've ever gone to another place and you're staying in somebody else's bed and you wake up and you're like, <laughs> where was I transported? Because uh, you're just in this fog. And... In that moment, you start to question, what is the reality? If you've been dreaming, you go, was the dream the reality, or is what I'm awakened to the reality? And I don't know about you, but there's sometimes I have a hard time figuring out which one is the actual reality. So there's this struggle of, what's going on? Uh, you realize that that kind of an idea is true when it comes to the physical and the spiritual realm of which we live. For example, we live in a physical world. Everyone nod your heads, right? We live in a reality. It's physical. But while we live in a physical reality, there is a spiritual dynamic that's also taking place. Now, you can't see it. You can't feel it, necessarily. But it's going on as well. Well, which one's the reality? Well, they both are. Uh, which one is more real, more real than the other one? Well, I would like to propose that the spiritual reality is more real than the physical reality. Does that make sense? So even though we live in a physical reality, world and realm, there's actually a reality that's actually more real than what we're currently living in. Now that may seem foreign to you because we don't see it, we can't touch it, we can't feel it, and yet it's reality. Okay? <clears throat> uh, you can see this clearly if you have the Second Kings passage. Uh, Second Kings chapter 6. I just want to use this as an example. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 6 <clears throat> there's this great, great Old Testament passage. Uh, there's this prophet by the name of Elisha. And uh, before him, there's the prophet Elijah. And Elijah is ascended into heaven. Elisha has taken his place. And Elisha is, he is just a stud. Uh, God is just doing tremendous miracles through the life of Elisha. God is just speaking tremendous words through the life of Elisha. So much so that over here in this country <clears throat> of Syria, the king says, hey, let's go and capture Israel. So we're going to go, we're going to come over to Israel, and we're going to literally capture the whole country of Israel and make them our slaves. Well, Elisha knows about it. And so he tells the king of Israel, hey, by the way, the king of Syria is going to be at such and such place at such and such time. Uh, why don't you take a force over there and meet him? So the king of Israel would take his force, go over there, meet him, and they would win the battle between the Syrians. A uh, few weeks or months go by. King of Syria goes, hey, let's go over here. And Elisha goes, hey, I know where you're coming from. So Elisha goes to the, the, 
goes to the king, hey, Syrians are going to be at such and such place at such and such time. Why don't you go take a troop over there? And eventually the king has this idea of, you know what? Every time we go to Israel, they know exactly where we're going to be. Obviously, there has to be a spy amongst my generals. So he brings all the generals together for a secret meeting, and he looks at them in the face and says, which one of you is a spy? Because obviously, uh, they know everything that's going on. So how would they know unless one of you are telling them? And uh, one of them speaks up and says, <laughs> none of us are spies. We wouldn't do that to you. But there's this prophet in Israel, and he knows, think about this, he knows what happens in your bedchamber. You, you know that pillow talk that you have? He hears that. I mean, that, that's intimidating. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't have pillow talk, so I don't know what that is. <laughs> but in my mind, as I'm mumbling myself to sleep, I don't want anybody to hear those mumblings. That's just a joke. I'm just... But literally, the idea was Elisha could hear everything that goes on in the bedchamber of the king. And the king goes, well, obviously the solution then is let's get Elisha. We get rid of Elisha, then we can take Israel, right? So the king of Syria goes, all right, where's Elisha? They say, he's in such and such place. So the king starts coming, and he finds where Elisha's little, little cabin is, and he surrounds it with his entire, think about this, the entire Syrian army. How many people is that? I don't know, at least tens of thousands, if not maybe 100,000 people. So they're going after one guy, just one guy. Okay, now look at, your, look at the Bible. 2 Kings chapter 6, <clears throat> look at verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such place. And a man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to that place, of which the man of God had told him, and thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. And therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Meaning, which one of you is a spy? And one of the servants says, None, my lord. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, go and see where he is, that I may sin and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he's in Dothan. Now think about this. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God, so the servant of Elisha, he arose early and went out, and there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. Think about this. Here is Elisha's servant. And Elisha's out over at the kitchen. He's making his oatmeal for the morning. And if you're doing this, it must be a really big bowl of oatmeal. So he's making his bowl of oatmeal. And uh, the servant goes, hey, I go get some water. So he goes over to the well, grabs the water. And he looks up and he goes, you know what? We're surrounded. And there's an entire army around us. So he runs back over to Elisha and goes, Alas, master! Look at verse six, or 15. Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he was obviously a little nervous. Why? Because the entire Syrian army was surrounding him. What did Elisha do? He kept stirring his oatmeal. No big deal. What's the problem? What's the concern? Why are you nervous? Who thinks like that? You have an entire army coming after you, and all you can think about is, I don't want to burn my oatmeal. Nobody thinks that way. And the servant, in, in, in reality, hey, it makes, sense to you, it makes sense to me, he looks at Elisha and says, Alas, what are we going to do? Why? Because we have an army. He was looking through his eyes, seeing what was happening in the physical, and he says, we, we, we're, in, we're in trouble. Make sense? What is Elisha doing? He's not looking through the lens of the physical. He's looking through the lens of the spiritual. And he says, no big deal. What's the problem? Okay? So it says, and I just love this. I uh, brings him outside, and Elisha answers him in verse 16. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, can you see the servant? If I was a servant, I would go, Elisha?
Obviously, you didn't take your medicine this morning because there's two of us and there's 100,000 of them. How can you say there are more of us than them? You're delusional. You're smoking crack or something. I mean, this is not okay. I mean, think with me. Does that not make sense? Who in their right mind looks at two people and says, hey, we're bigger and stronger than a whole host of army? That does not make sense. That's stupid. But Elisha was not looking in the physical. He was looking from the spiritual. So it says that Elisha prayed for his servant that his eyes would be open. And do you know what happened? His eyes were open. It's amazing what happens when you pray. And when his eyes were open, it says he looked around the mountaintops around, and there was horses and chariots of fire. Now, not just horses and not just chariots. We're talking horses and chariots of fire. Now, if I saw one horse and one chariot on fire, I'd been like, let's go back and have our oatmeal. But we saw an entire army of horses and chariots of fire. And obviously, the, the servant looks at Elisha and says, oh, well, what's the big deal? Let's just go in. Now, the rest of the story, if you, if you read through it, I just think this is hilarious. Elisha goes out to the commander of the entire army. They're looking for Elisha. Elisha goes, who are you looking for? We're looking for Elisha. Oh, I know where he's at. <laughs> now, Elisha prays. He prays that the servant's eyes would be open to see the spiritual. And then he prays that the Syrian armies would be blinded, and the entire army was blinded. Physically, they were blinded. Everybody. And so when he walks up and says, who are you looking for? We're looking for Elisha. <laughs> Let me show you where he's at. And Elisha literally guides the entire army to another country. <laughs> this wasn't like a mile down the road. He took them to another country, left them there, <laughs> And then prayed that their eyes would be open. <laughs> and they went, we're not in the same place. Toto, we're no longer in Kansas. Kind of, in a, kind of a deal. And Elisha, Elisha escaped, and there was a great, tremendous victory for Israel. Do you not realize that there is something going on in the physical realm, but there's something greater going on in the spiritual realm? And what I would like to propose to you is while the physical realm is real and true, the dynamic of what is taking place in the spiritual is even more real and more true. Meaning, you could look at this and say, Ah, alas, master, we're surrounded. But if you had this perspective, you would go, Ah, oh, no big deal. What would happen if this became our normal perspective of life? Meaning, we see wind and waves down here, and yet we sit on the boat saying, Ah, no big deal, they're just wind and waves. Now, what would happen if we saw the down here, instead of looking at the flat tires, we would sit up here going, oh, there's a dynamic flowing, God is doing something, and this flat tire is not an issue. What would happen if we saw financial crisis, the fact that we have no money, instead of looking at it from this perspective going, ah, what are we going to do? What if we would just say, oh, Jesus, I'm trusting you? Because there's something more real and dynamic happening in the spiritual realm than what's happening down here in the physical. Make sense? No. If you take that idea and come to the book of Ephesians, Paul just hammers this idea in the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 6. We're going to start in chapter 1. <laughs> Sorry. But Paul just goes after this idea, and I just want to walk through this with you. So the first, the first time this happens uh, is in Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, verse 3, okay? So the first instance we have this idea is in Ephesians 1, 3. Now let me give you the word that Paul uses. Uh, the word in the Greek is the word uperanios. Let's see if I know how to spell it. Uperanios, which may mean nothing to you, but that's the word. <clears throat> the word uperanios uh, means it's like the abode of God. It means the living place of God. And we understand that God is everywhere, but
but it's almost like in the Uperanios, there's a concentrated version or form of God. It's like more intense. It's more palatable. And if you look at Ephesians 1, chapter 3, uh, this is what Paul writes. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, the word heavenly places is this word right here, uperanios. So oftentimes it's translated heavenly places or heavenly realms, okay? So it's the heavenly realms, it's the heavenly places <clears throat> of which God dwells. Now again, God is everywhere, but somehow in the heavenly realms, there's like a more concentrated, it's more intense, uh, it, it's like the throne room of God idea. Uh, that kind of idea is, is, it's this word. Now, it's, the root of this is used 20 times throughout the New Testament, but Paul specifically uses this word in Ephesians. So the five times that this word shows up, it only appears in Ephesians, which in my mind is significant because it just emphasizes the idea of what Paul is trying to tell you is, whoa, in the book of Ephesians, this is a big deal. Okay? So he uses it in almost every single chapter. And he says, get a hold of this. You've got to get a hold of this. This is a big deal. And he structures the book of Ephesians around this idea of the heavenly realm. Ah, a couple ideas with the uperanios. One is the idea that it's not in the future. Meaning it's not like, oh, one day when we get to heaven, it'll be all crystal clear, it'll be amazing, the streets of gold. That's not this. This dynamic is taking place at this very moment. So while the physical is going on, the heavenly realms is also going on. Okay? Uh, there's another idea associated with the uperanios, which means it's not, the idea is it's not out there somewhere, meaning, oh, you know, if you just go on a little past Pluto to the left a little bit, uh, it's right over there. It's not that idea. The idea is the uperanios is pressing in upon us. So it's not out there somewhere. It's literally pressing. It's, it's just, oh, it's coming upon you. It's just forcing itself upon you. It's just... It's the atmosphere of which you're around. It's that idea. And uh, the other idea is, uh, is that even though it's pressing itself upon you, you cannot get to it. Meaning if you were to stretch out your hand, it's just, just beyond your fingertips. It's just beyond who you are. And, and you, can't, you can't quite reach the heavenly realms on your own. So it's pressing in upon you, but you, you can't quite make it. Does that make sense? Well, how do I get in this? Oh, Jesus. And the idea is, we have to be, and Paul, Paul is just so strong on this in the book of Ephesians, you have to be in Christ. In Christ. In fact, if you were just to look up the passages where he says, in him, in Christ, he just says it over and over and over and over and over again in the book of Ephesians. Why? Because your location is in Christ. You're, you are to be seated smack dab in the middle of Jesus. Uh, you're, you are never to get up from who he is. You are to find your spot in him. And you are never to waver, get up, move, change locations from that location. In Christ. In, 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 in him. In him. What I say? In him. Because that's our location. And it's only when we find ourselves in him does the life of God start to flow out. So you realize that I cannot access the heavenly realms of my own. It's just beyond who I am. But the moment that I find myself in Jesus, oh, there's a dynamic that takes place, and suddenly I can enter into the heavenly realms, not because of who I am, but because of who he is. And the moment that I'm, uh, I think it's Isaiah, he says that we are cloaked with his robe of righteousness. Meaning, Jesus, on his, in his death, in his blood, on the cross, he literally covered us with a cloak, a robe, which is himself, and it's his righteousness. And it's only when we have his righteousness can we enter into the throne room. The moment that we say, oh, I have this figured out, I can handle it, and we take off the robe, the moment we find ourselves outside the heavenly realm. So the key to be in the heavenly realms is to be in the person of Jesus. Does that make sense? He used to be in you. You are to be in him. There's an intimacy that is taking place. And when that intimacy is taking place, whoo, you find yourself in the heavenly realms. Okay? Everyone with me so far? 
Did I lose anybody? Okay. So that's the idea. Now, what I want to do is I want to walk through these passages where this word is found in, in the book of Ephesians and I give you some content to what this means for your life. Okay? So again, the first time this shows up is Ephesians 1, chapter 3. So let's, let us read it again. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So what is he saying? Oh, get this. This is so neat. <clears throat> the word blessing in our passage, uh, if you look at it, the word blessing shows up three times. Blessed be the God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. So three times the word blessing shows up. Uh, one of them is an adjective. One of them is a verb. And the other one is a noun. Aren't you excited? And if you go, I don't remember sixth grade grammar at all. Let me explain them to you. The first one is the blessed God idea. And this is an adjective. <clears throat> what this means is, is that an adjective describes something about a noun. So the noun is God, so he's, he's the subject, he's the big deal. And the word blessed is an attribute that describes who God is, meaning our God is a blessed God. Our God is blessed. Our God lives in a state of blessing. Okay? Well, where does that blessing come from? Oh, there is nothing greater than God, so nothing can bestow blessing upon him. God is so immense and great that blessing just oozes out of every pore of his body. Whoa. He doesn't have a body, but if he did, it would ooze out of every pore of his body. In other words, uh, God is so blessed, it's like there's this mist or a fog of which God lives in. And it's called blessing. He literally is a blessed God. And he's constantly just, he's speaking out blessing. And he's just living in blessing. And he's just surrounded by blessing. And all around the throne, throne of God, there's this fog, this haze, a mist, a blessing. Could you imagine what that would be like? And God is a blessed God, which I just think is awesome. Now, the second time it's the word blessing is used, it says he has blessed us. And this is a verb. Meaning... There's an action going on. Well, what's the action? Oh, God is doing blessing. So here you have a blessed God who lives in a state of blessing who is blessing something or someone. Now, what is he blessing? Us. Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, if I was God and I was living in a state of blessing, I would be pronouncing blessing, but there's nothing. You, you bless what's better than you. You bless what's greater. What's greater than God? Nothing. So I would just be blessing myself. Bless God, bless God, bless God. Woo! I got it. Bless God. Woo! I mean, if I was God, that's what I'd be doing. Never mind. But you realize that God loves us so much, that God is so intent upon your life, that what is he doing? He is, out of the blessing that he's living in, he goes, oh, I got to do something with this, and therefore he's giving, bestowing blessing on you. Isn't that awesome? You are blessed. Why? Because God is blessing you. So get this picture. Here's God. He's in a state amidst a blessing. And literally there is such a blessing, there's such an intensity of blessing that he just sits there. He's just like, i got to do something with this. Well, what is he going to do? Well, I'm going to pronounce blessing. Well, how does he pronounce blessing? Oh, he's going to speak blessing in your life. And suddenly he opens his mouth and whoa, and just vomits all over you. And what does he vomit over you? Blessing which is a good vomit if you're going to have vomit over you. Forget it. That was stupid. Ah, but you are being blessed. There's a blessing that is coming upon your life. Why? Because God is blessed, and he has to do something with it. And he's going to say, you know what? I'm just going to dump it all upon you, which is phenomenal. Do you realize how insane that is? You are nothing but spit and dirt, and yet God looks at you, and says, oh, blessing, blessing, blessing. 
and the blessing that should be reserved for him is given to you. Oh, I just think that's incredible. Now, the third time the word blessing is used is it says, what kind of blessing is he blessing us with? Oh, he's blessing with every spiritual blessing. And that's a noun. And the board's going to fall over. <coughs> so what he is blessing you with is every spiritual blessing. Okay? So here's the picture. Here's God sitting upon his throne, living in this ooze, this fog, this haze of blessing. It becomes so intense he has to do something about it. So he opens his mouth and whoa, he just spills forth blessing upon you. Well, what does that blessing consist of? Oh! It's every spiritual blessing. Now you look at me and you say, well, then what is every spiritual blessing that he's bestowing upon me? <gasps> Do you know what every blessing God has for your life is? Jesus. So literally, the every spiritual blessing is the person of Jesus. And I can prove that to you because what he does in verse 4 down to verse 14 is he says, let me tell you about your every spiritual blessing. So he sets this up and says, all right, now that we've established this blessing idea, let me tell you about every spiritual blessing. So in verse 5 down to verse 6, he says, these are the blessings that we have in the Father. Verse 7 down to verse 12 is the blessings we have in the Son. And uh, 13 and 14 is the blessings we have in the Spirit. But every single blessing that he's speaking in your life is found in the person of Jesus. So let me just read some of these blessings. He says in verse 4 that you are chosen. Do you realize that uh, when I was growing up and we were picking the dodgeball teams, I was always the kid picked last. And I know why. Because I had no ability. And I was like this short little chubby guy who had no athletic ability. And I was the easy out. So nobody wanted me on their team. Do you realize that God doesn't choose you like that? You are the very first one picked. And oddly enough, I'm the very first one picked too. So how you and I can both be the first one picked, I don't know. But he picks us first. And you are, we are all chosen in him. Isn't that just neat? Uh, it says you've been accepted. Uh, we've been made holy. We've made, made, been made blameless. We've been adopted as children. We've been redeemed and forgiven and given all wisdom and prudence. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And we are a partaker of the mystery. Well, what are each of those blessings found? It's found in Jesus. And as we keep hounding here, Jesus, or God, is not a store clerk where he dispenses blessing. Meaning, you don't go up to God and you say, God, I need a blessing. He goes, oh, I have yours. Now let me go to the back room, pull off the, pull off the jar, hand you the little pill, and say, whoop, there's your blessing for today. That's not how it works. You go up to God and say, God, I need, I need love today. I need the fruit of the Spirit, love. He goes, oh, I have that in pill form. Goes to the back, grabs the pill, hands it to you. That's not how it works. You go, God, I need love, and what does he give you? Jesus. And in the moment of getting Jesus, you have your love. See, the problem if he gave you a pill called love is you would leave, and a few minutes down the road you go, you know what, I didn't need love, I need, a, I need a patient. So you'd run up to God and go, God, I didn't need love, I need patience. I need patience, patience, patience right now. I mean, like right now, I need patience. And he'd say, oh, I have a pill for you. See, that's not how God works. You go, God, I need patience. And he goes, ah, I have the answer. It's Jesus. And the moment of embracing Jesus, you not only get patience, but you get love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So if you go up to him asking for love and find out you need patience, whoo, you still have it because it's Jesus. So every blessing that God has for you, it's not like, well, today I'm going to give you chosen. Tomorrow I'll give you accepted. That's not how it works. Every blessing that God has for your life is found in the person of Jesus, which means once you have Jesus, you have every spiritual blessing. Does that make sense? Now, Paul then tells you, where does all of this take place? Look at verse 3. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the blessed God living in this ooze, a fog, a haze of blessing, who has blessed us. He pronounced his blessing in your life with every spiritual blessing in the Uperanios. So where does all of this stuff take place? Oh, it's in the heavenly realms. So do you realize 
that if you want to get in on the blessings of God, you have to get into the heavenly realms. Well, how do you get into the heavenly realms? Jesus. Which is awesome, because the moment you get into the heavenly realms, you have every spiritual blessing, because it's Jesus as well. Everyone okay? All right. <clears throat> so that's the first time Paul uses heavenly realms. Now, if you go to the next one, which is in chapter, uh, the end of chapter 1, verse, uh, let's read verse 17. Uh, Paul is praying in this passage, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. He says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. So Paul's praying, he says, hey, would you get a hold of Jesus? And everything that he prays in the prayer is about Jesus. Would you get wrapped up in him? Would you let him get wrapped up in you? Now in verse 19, he says, let me describe the power of God. Now it's utterly indescribable, but I'm going to attempt to describe the power of God. Now, if you were here when we worked through this, I'm about to do this really quick. But Paul uses four different Greek words for the word power. Uh, one of them is this idea that God lives in a state of authority and sovereignty and power, and you cannot bend God's arm behind his back. I mean, God is in control. Woo! I mean, you, you, hey, you can't force him to do anything. Why? He lives in a state of just authority and power and control. He lives in that. Now, the other word that Paul uses is the word iskis, which, as we looked at, it's the resource of power. So it's the whoa kind of stuff. And the example that we kept using was Sean has the iskis, whoa, the, the, the resource, the ability to bench press 25 pounds. Now, I know some of you are in awe and shock because it seems unbelievable. But, yes, Sean, our music guy, can bench press, whoa, 25 pounds. Now, he's not doing anything, but he has the whoa the ability to do it, okay? Now, the moment that he walks over to the bench and he goes, Wah! okay, that word is dunamis. It's the, it's, it's the word where we get the dynamite. It's the explosion kind of stuff. And so what Paul is saying is, do you know who our God is? Our God has the Wah! unlimited resource. Wah! And he's literally marching that into your world, creating these dynamite explosions, showcasing who he is. And as I've continued to say, do you know what your life is supposed to be? Your life is supposed to be the dynamite explosion showcasing God's wall to tell the world, whoo, there is a God. Okay? So when someone looks at my life, if they see a pop, that's not very impressive. If they see a stick of dynamite, then they go, you know what? I don't think that's Nathan. <laughs> Because he's dumber than a rock. So obviously it must be Jesus. So what is going on in my life is supposed to be so dynamic and so huge that it only points to God's whoa. Okay? Now, you walk up to Paul and say, all right, I kind of, that kind of makes sense. Give me an example. And he goes, oh, let me give you the example of Jesus. And in verse 20, down to verse 23, he talks about the power of God demonstrated in the life of Jesus. Look at verse 20. It says, which he, speaking of the power, this power he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the Uperanios. Do you realize that the place that Jesus is at this very moment is whoa, the heavenly realms? So here's what Paul's saying. Here's Jesus, deader than a doornail. He's food for worms, pushing up daisies. I mean, he's dead. I mean, he's dead, dead. Right? And what takes place? Oh, G God takes his hand, reaches into physical death, yanks Jesus from physical death into physical life. And if that wasn't good enough, he takes Jesus from physical life and throws him, maybe doesn't throw him, but he brings him into the heavenly realms and sits him smack dab at the right hand of God which, by the way, verse 21, 
is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things underneath his feet, and he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Woo! Do you realize that the place that Jesus is sitting at this very moment is in the heavenly realms. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, which is far above every principality, power, might, and dominion. In fact, everything, I mean everything, is underneath the feet of Jesus. Whoa. But it's in this location. And as, we talked, as we've talked before, in just some of our own studies, the idea of the right hand of God, the right side is the side of power, it's the side of authority, it's the side of righteousness, it's the side of blessing, it's also the side of dependency and intimacy. Do you know where Jesus is sitting? He's sitting in the place of power, authority, might, dominion, dependency, intimacy upon the Father. So even at this very moment, Jesus has all authority. Why? Because he's in that location at the right hand of the Father. But he's also the place of complete dependency upon the Father. Why? That's his location. But it's in the heavenly, heavenly realms. Uh, do you realize that this had to take place in order for the spiritual dynamic to take place in your life? And I, well, we've said it around here before, but if Jesus merely raised from the dead and stayed physical on a physical world, then he could not have ascended into heaven and given you the Holy Spirit. In, in the book of John, Jesus says, Woo, what you are going to have if I depart is far better than me being in the physical, right here. Now, do I believe he's in the physical here? I do. I think he's still physical. How that works, I don't know, but I believe he's physical. He ascended physical, he's coming back physical, he's physical. But, if he did not ascend, you would not have what you have. Okay? Which means that he is in the location for you to get what you need, which is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, William Law made a great statement once. He said, um, the purchase of the cross was not merely forgiveness, it was Pentecost. Meaning what God was doing to this whole cross thing was not just so you can have forgiveness. Yes, that's a part of it. Yes, that's huge. But one of the dynamics of you, uh, of the cross, was not just forgiveness, it was the fact that the outside guy was going to get inside, and now you have the Spirit of God living and reigning in and through your life, which is phenomenal. But his location is right here, whoo, in the heavenly realms, okay? Uh, which is uh, chapter 1, verse 20, the heavenly realms. Uh, the third time this is used is in chapter 2, verse 6. So turn the page and look at chapter 2. <clears throat> in chapter 2, uh, verse 1 through 3, Paul says, Let me tell you about you. You are dead in trespasses and sins. You're all wrapped up in darkness. Your life is polluted with sin. You're full of just darkness, death, and damnation. I mean, you are just full of crud. That's who we are. That's what we're born into. But he says in verse 4, In the midst of all that, but God, meaning, yes, you are full of darkness. Yes, you are full of death. Yes, you are full of selfishness. Yes, you are full of sin. But not any longer. Why? But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. <coughs> For by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the uperanios, in Christ Jesus. So get this idea. Here's Jesus, deader than a doornail, pushing up daisies, food for worms. God takes his hand, reaches into a physical death, raises a physically dead Jesus from physical death into physical life. And then he takes the physically alive Jesus and brings him into the heavenly realms and sits him in the heavenly realms at the right hand of the Father, 
far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things underneath his feet. That's this place. Then, in chapter 2, Paul goes, but do you know what God has done for you? The exact same thing. But instead of being in the physical realm, we're talking spiritual dynamic. Here you are, deader than a doornail. Food for worms, pushing up daisies. Well, not physically dead, but spiritually. Why? I'm full of sin, I'm full of selfishness, I'm full of darkness, death, destruction, damnation. That's what's going on in my life. Spiritually. And just as the Father reached down into the physically dead life of Jesus, so God reached down into my phys- or spiritual dead life. And just as he raised a physically dead Jesus from death into life, so he raises a spiritually dead Nathan from death into life. Whoa! And if that wasn't good enough, which it would be good enough, but if that wasn't good enough, then he takes the spiritually alive Nathan and brings him into the heavenly realms and sits him, whoa, smack dab in the middle of Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father. Now, if I am seated in Christ at the right hand of the Father, In the heavenly realms, do you realize then what is going on in the heavenly realms, in the person of Jesus, is what is to be going on in my life in the heavenly realms because I'm in him. Meaning, here's Jesus at the right hand of the Father. His location is far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, and all things have been placed underneath his feet. Whoa! Do you realize that as I am sitting in Christ in the heavenly realms, that I am sitting in a place that's far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, and all things have been placed underneath my feet. Whoa! But not because I'm special. It's because I'm found in him. The moment I get out of him, all that stuff's not true. And somehow, there's a spot smack dab in the person of Jesus that's big enough for you. And yet it's big enough for me. Isn't that just awesome? So what is taking place in the life of Jesus at this very moment can be going on in my life this very moment. And the spiritual dynamic that is taking place in the heavenly realms in Christ can be going on in my life at this very moment in the heavenly realms. Don't get excited, just sit there. And according to Romans chapter 6, this is true, period. There's no question about this. This is absolutely positively true. Well, I'm not experiencing it. I don't feel it. I've never never had that kind of victory. Paul says, Romans chapter 6, you have to reckon this to be true. This is truth. You have to look at it and say, all right, I'm going to believe that that's true. And it's as you're reckoning and believing that it's true that you start to walk in it that you find yourself, ah, oh, it's true, and you start living it. Not you living it, the spirit in you living it. But you have to, yes, I believe this is true. If it's true and you don't believe it, example, I'm going to give you a $20 bill. This is just an illustration. This is not true. Nobody come up to me afterward and say, you promised a $20 bill. I don't have any $20 bills to give you. Talk to Delphine. Here's... Just kidding. She doesn't have me either. I've already asked. So I have a $20 bill. I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to put it right here on this altar. Now, is it a fact that I've given you a $20 bill? Yes. And if you walk out this room and say, Whoa, I have a $20 bill. Nathan gave me a $20 bill. Someone goes, show it to me. It's on the altar. So you don't have it. Well, no, but it's true. You have to pick up the $20 bill for it to be true. Make sense? Is this factual? Yes, this is factual. But until you go, woo! Did that confuse anybody? Probably so. Talk to Stephen later. He can correct all my problems. Uh, The third time, oh, we got to hurry. The third time this is used, turn a page over to chapter 3, look at verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. Paul says, chapter 3, verse 10. (coughs) 
to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, let me just read it again and I'll, I'll explain it. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. What he's saying, think about this. Here's the church. Well, who's the church? You and I. It's the church. The, not this church, but the global church. He's saying that the church is to make something known. What is being made known? Oh, the manifold wisdom of God. So the church is to make the wisdom of God known. Oh, to who? The principalities and the powers that are in this heavenly realm. So in the heavenly realm... Uh, this is, by the way, this is where all the spiritual warfare takes place, is in the heavenly places, in the, he in the spiritual realm. Think about this. The church, down here in the physical, is to take the wisdom of God, which is from here, takes the wisdom of God and literally looks up at the heavenly realms and says, see that wisdom of God? It's true. And the church, you and I, make the wisdom of God known to what's going on up here. So let me explain this. Uh, here's the angelic. Here's the demonic realm. Okay? There's a battle taking place between the angels and the demons. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, it's been going on for years and years and centuries and millenniums. Okay? <clears throat> it's coming to a close pretty quick, but it's, I mean, it's been happening and happening. And do they know the spiritual dynamic of God? Sure they do. Do they know about the wisdom of God? Sure they do. They probably know more than you do. In fact, I'm pretty confident they know more than you do. And yet, somehow, the church down here takes the wisdom of God and tells what's going on up here the wisdom of God. I know you're looking confused. Let me, I, I, apparently not. Here's the angelic and demonic forces. Do they know about the wisdom of God? Sure. They've been living in it now for millenniums. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years. They've been living in this. There's been this battle raging. But as they look down upon the physical, they look at the church, you and I, and they say, is, is what God is saying reality? In other words, you come to the Word of God, and God starts making promises. Hey, you can have victory. You can have triumph. Are you going to be filled with the Spirit of God? Is, is, is His life flowing in you? Is there, a, is there a dynamic taking place? Is there a flow? Is there a... Now, think about this. If I call myself a Christian, and yet I'm living in sin, I'm living in darkness, I'm living in death, what that is proclaiming to the heavenly realms is God's truth is not true. Now, they know that this is true, but they're not seeing it being lived. Okay? So they look at a, they look at a life who says, I'm going to call myself a Christian, but I'm going to source this by my own power. I'm going to call myself a Christian, but I'm going to live in selfishness. I'm going to call myself a Christian, and yet just look at God and go, I'm going to do my own way. Well, that's not this. And so what it tells the heavenly realms is, this is not true. Now, think about the other hand. You have this guy who's a Christian who says, God, I cannot live my life. You're going to have to live your life through me. He starts depending upon the Spirit. The very flow of God starts moving in his life. He starts having victory in his life over sin. He starts having triumph. He starts speaking the, uh, the words of God. He starts thinking with the mind of Christ. He starts acting with the flow of, of Jesus upon his, upon his life. And suddenly, do you know what that tells the heavenly realms? Woo, this is true! And somehow, think about this, your and my life tells the heavenly realms whether or not this is true. Now, they know it's true, but it's like when they see your life, they're like, ah, ah, see, look, I knew it was true. I knew, but look, it's really true. Why? Because it's being lived. Do you see the opposite of that, though? You look at a church who's all about division and hatred and gossip and wah, 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 wah. 
And what does that tell in the heavenly realms? I thought this thing was real, but maybe it's not. And what is taking place in our life, and in essence, is giving ammunition to the heavenly realms. So when your life is living with victory and triumph and the flow of God, you realize that strengthens what is taking place in the heavenly realms. When you're living in defeat and mockery of what God is doing, then you're giving ammunition to the demonic darkness of the heavenly realm saying, I told you it's not true, huh? Do you, do you realize how important it is to be in Christ and living in his flow and his victory? Because it's literally affecting the spiritual realms of which we live. If you want a great picture of this, read Frank Peretti's This Present Darkness or Piercing the Darkness. There's, it's, it's a fiction book, but he looks at, there's physical characters, there's demonic characters, and there's angelic characters. And they get confusing, so it's helpful to write down all their names and put them where they go. But what happens is someone's living a life in the physical world, and literally they're playing with witchcraft and the occult, and it literally strengthens the demonic flow within that city. Now, you don't see it, you don't smell it, but there's a darkness that hovers over that. Walk into Las Vegas. I promise you, if you are spiritually attuned, there's a darkness and a heaviness upon the city of Las Vegas. Why? Do you know what's taking place in Las Vegas? There's ammunition just being, whoa, to the spiritual dynamic that is about death and destruction. And Hey, you want to go to a, a little town, a little village in China, where suddenly everyone's, uh, they were told about Jesus, everyone's a Christian, and suddenly, even in the midst of communism, there's just a flow of Jesus. You want to go there and feel the spiritual dynamic? Hey, they are given ammunition to the spiritual realities, and there's like this peace that you just can't describe, that when you walk in the place, it's like, you know, there's something different. Wouldn't it be interesting if what was taking place in cross Isle Church and what's taking place in Lebanon, Lebanon, Tennessee, there was such a flow of the Spirit of God in this group of people, that literally that we were, there would be such a sweetness of God's presence, and what was coming out of our lives was affecting the spiritual realm at such a level that the atmosphere of Lebanon, Tennessee was affected. And when people were driving on 40, just through the edges, the outskirts of Lebanon, they would go, whoa, stop, we've got to eat here. Why? I don't know, there's something different about this town. Oh, could you imagine what that would do to a, Uh, you realize that our life is supposed to be the demonstration to the heavenly realms, and our life is supposed to be the demonstration to the physical realm of the realities of God. Uh, here is little David. Here's the entire Israelite army. Over there are the Philistines, and there's this big, hunking, ugly dude named Goliath. Nine to 13 feet tall. He's a giant, and he's mocking Israel. For 40 days. And Israel, none of them believed that they could take Goliath. Did they believe the realities of what was taking place? No, they were rejecting the promises of God. Do you know what that's doing to the spiritual dynamic? David shows up on the scene and he goes, Stop for just a second. Are you guys insane? Why has this been going on for 40 days? He gets up on the scene, he looks at Goliath, and he says, I will not allow an uncircumcised Philistine to mock my God. So you better hold your hat. I'm coming after you, and I'm going to cut off your head. And Goliath goes, ha oh, ha, whatever, whatever. And it says that David hastened after Goliath. I was telling the teens last night, the word hastened means liquid veracity. The idea is a cheetah going after a gazelle. Meaning, when a, when a cheetah goes after a gazelle, it doesn't go, hmm, let me tiptoe up to it and see if I can catch it. When a cheetah goes after a gazelle, it's, whoa! And every time the gazelle moves, it moves. There's a liquid ferocity. Do you realize what David did with Goliath was not, I always had the picture, here's Goliath, here's David, he takes a step, David takes a step, swirls, hits, tonk, runs over, cuts his head off. It's not what happened. According to the passage, it says that David hastened toward Goliath, which means, here's Goliath, here's little David. He goes, I'm coming after you, grabs a sling, puts a rock in, starts twirling, and he's running as fast as he can to Goliath. He has one shot. He doesn't even have time to grab another rock. He throws the rock as he's running full speed. If he misses, he's going to hit the kneecaps of Goliath. 
He is running, swirls, hits, falls. He's already there, cuts the head off. Whoa, it's over with. And David says, this is a proclamation to the entire world that my God is my God. And he says who he is. And he's promised that my God cannot lie. And his life became a testimony not only to the heavenly realms, but to everyone looking on that God is who God is. Elijah and the prophets of Baal. <coughs> you, have, you have all these priests. And they start doing the sacrifice thing. No sacrifices. Elijah shows up and says, watch what my God will do. Throws the water, throws the water, throws the water, throws the water. Fire comes down, torches the whole thing. Not only burns up the sacrifice, burns up the wood on the sacrifice. It burns up the stones. I don't know how hot that has to be, but it like melts the stones, and it eats up all the dirt underneath. So I don't know if there's this big, huge crevice down to the middle of the center of the earth, but it ate up the dirt. And it's said that everybody fell on their faces and said, Oh, your God is the God. And his life was a testimony not only to the heavenly realms, but to the physical realm, that this is true. Now, the other time this is used, and I'll, this is just real quick, is in chapter 6, with the armor of God. He says in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realms. Do you realize that what is going on in the heavenly realms is a battle? And what, the battle that's going on in the heavenly realms, Paul says, is more dynamic than the physical battle. We could grab swords and we could start cutting off heads, but that's not nearly as intense as the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, the battle is far more intense, it's far more costly, it's far more dangerous, it's far more important than the physical battle. And this is where we are battling nowadays. We're not in the physical battle. We're in a spiritual battle. Now, really quick. What would happen if your life was not lived down here? What if it was lived here? Now, I understand physically you have to be here. But what if in the middle of being in the middle of this, you were living here? What if you would say, Jesus, I understand that What's taking place in my life does not look good from this perspective. I don't want this perspective. I want this perspective, and I'm going to live in the middle of this despite the fact that I'm living here. Quick example. <clears throat> you look at the world today, and if you were to look at the world today, you would say, Jesus is not king. <laughs> he does not sit upon a throne in our world. In the physical, Jesus is hated. He's mocked. He's despised. Hey, you look at the economy. You look at money. You look at... Uh, sexual, uh, sensualism, all this stuff reigns in people's life. Materialism, greed, whatever you want to name, is on the throne of everyone's life. Can I tell you, that may be true here, but that's not true here. Here, Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the reality. And this is more real than this is real. And I promise you, one day, this is going to become real here, and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. What if we would live on this dynamic to such a degree that it would change how we started seeing things here so that this became, in essence, what was taking place here? As a side note, you realize that what is going on here affects the physical. The spiritual affects the physical. But the physical also affects the spiritual. When Jesus died upon a cross, it was a physical death down here. But it affected an entire spiritual realm and dynamic. So they, there's this connection and this interchange that what is going on affects the other. What if you would no longer live from this perspective? And what if you would let Jesus live from this perspective in and through your life? What if this became your reality? What if this became your perspective? What if this became the dynamic? What if in the middle of hardship you go, Jesus, I don't want to look at the hardship. I want to look square in your face. C.T. Studd, one, one of my favorite missionaries of old, used to say, don't just give me a lion to fight. I want a bearer or two besides to show forth the glory and the power of my God. Why? Because he's living here. I don't even want a lion. And he said, hey, throw in a lion, a couple bears, hey, whatever. Why? Because I know the reality here. C.T. Stead's going through financial difficulty. Do you know what his statement, used, his statement always was? I've been saying this a lot lately. He gets to the end of his finances. He would go, "Woo! thank you, Jesus. He goes, man, isn't it great? That God will leave his reputation in our hands. 
As if to say, God is not going to abuse his reputation as the God who is faithful and promises and will supply all that you need. So we have nothing? Well, then God has something up his sleeve because he has to provide. And he's not going to taint his reputation. Why? That is this perspective. In the middle of the difficulties and the hardships and the wind and the waves, you look at this going, oh, I trust you. I can see this. I can just, whoa. Could you live on this level? And what would it, do you realize if you lived on this level what that would do down here in your life? Problems would no longer be problems. Situations would no longer be situations. Addiction would no longer be addiction. Difficulties would no longer be difficulties. Why? Because you're seeing it through the eyes and the lens of God. And if you're in him, then you're here. Would you let him suck you up and give you that perspective? Hmm. Let's pray. Jesus. Ah, Jesus, I need to live in the spiritual dynamic and flow. And Lord, it just seems that so often I'm living in the physical. I'm living out of my own mindset. I'm living at, oh, how has this affected me? And I have troubled times and difficulties and low in finances. And it's just, ah! God, I don't want that perspective. God, I want a heavenly realm perspective that despite what is going on in my life in the physical, I would see you in the dynamic of the spiritual and just go, oh, surely there's, Horses and chariots of fire around about. And God, whether I physically see that or not, I want to live with that dynamic living in and through my life. Jesus, I just pray that despite what is going on in my life, that you give me a higher perspective that sees you as you are. Oh, would you flow your life in and through me? Would you never let me get out of being in Christ? Because it is only when I'm smack dab in the middle of you does this reality take place. Oh, we desperately need you, Jesus. Oh, I desperately need you, Jesus. Uh, Jesus, we just love you and thank you for what you're doing in our midst in these days. And we just passionately, passionately, overwhelmingly love you. And we just pray these things in your precious and holy name. Oh, and powerful name. Amen.